consciousness is um, are were related only to stability aggregation, you know that type of information. We yeah you know, we didn't do anything related to the drug performance or efficacy. Um, so that would be obviously a separate type of test you need to do. Um, all right. So then we also have. Um, on the right-hand side, this was act, we, we looked at the Arrhenius plot, which we, we put together based on aggregation rates at each different temperature. Um, so for each of the samples, biosimilar in reference, we had it at a specific temperature and we calculated an aggregation rate with Argen and we were able to then get the activation energy for each of them. And what we found, as you can see there, is very, very close, almost identical activation energies. As, and as you can see from the graph, they're virtually laying on top of each other. So again, what you would be looking for when you're comparing your biosimilar to your reference drug. Next slide. Okay, and uh, so just another test was, as I mentioned earlier, we can do aggregation rate uh, to, to calculate or understand the time to dimerization. Um, so again, we did that at the different temperatures and you can see here, you know, from yeah, something like 45C to 80C, how they behave uh, in terms of the time of dimerization. And again, very, very similar, very little difference between the two samples. Um, and then on the right-hand side, this was interesting is, uh, we were testing at different RPM rates. So we have control over the actual rate, um, of the, the stir bar in the solution. Um, and so we were assessing what the shear stress was. Oh, sorry, go back. Um, do you go back one more slide? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so we were looking at the, the shear stress under those different rates. Um, again, you know, actually this one, we saw some differences. Uh, what's interesting with aggregation rate, especially the way we're doing it, there, there are some statistics uh, in that type of measurement. So Without more study, we couldn't really dig into it. It wasn't as important for the client, but what was interesting is the fact that we can do these comparisons and maybe with enough data, you could, you could come to some conclusions around sensitivity to shear. Uh, and one last note is that all of these experiments were carried out just in a matter of a couple of days. Uh, so we were able to set up blocks of experiments in each of the cells uh, and, and run and collect all this data. Uh, so it's pretty easy to put this type of study together using our gen. Great, thanks. I'll hand off to, uh, to Professor Reed now. Thank you, Alex. Um, Unmute here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead and start. And uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity to uh, give a talk in India while sitting on my farm in Mississippi. This is fantastic. Uh, so Alice gave a good introduction. And uh, of course, I can't use the, uh, the mouse. Um, but these are the topics I want to uh, skim through. This is kind of a panoramic overview rather than a detailed dive into any one area. Quickly look at the differences between total intensity light scattering and dynamic. So I think dynamic light scattering is actually more widespread than static light scattering. Uh, by the way, total intensity light scattering is essentially synonymous with static light scattering, SLS. Um, then we'll look at equilibrium, equilibrium characterization of proteins before they even begin to aggregate under stable conditions. And then we'll look at the kinetics that Alex was talking about under different stressors and we'll uh, stress temperature and stirring. Uh, then reproducibility is obviously a very big issue with something like aggregation because it's kind of a nightmare process. Is it even repeatable? We'll look at that. And then by doing the kinetics in real time, we get nonlinear signatures, and those tell us a lot about the mechanism of aggregation. Uh, Alex mentioned you can use it as a complementary method, and so we have used it as a way of meaningfully sample uh, for GPC. Uh, and then as 
we all know protein aggregates can start to particulate, make submicron particles. They can get you know, the postmicron particles and so on. Uh, so we'll see the capability there. Uh, we're also working with um, uh, different modes of degradation, set of aggregation, uh, clipping molecules apart. So uh, hyaluronic acid, for example, being cleaved by uh, hyaluronidase. Um, and we'll see what kind of time we have left. But at the end, I would like to at least get to that inline multi-detector device, please. Okay, so quick tutorial. Uh, you have static light scattering, which is what Argen does. Um, it's a single angle measurement, it's at 90 degrees. So it's not malls in the sense of having multiple angles. Uh, proteins happen to be of a diameter that uh, you're in the Rayleigh scattering regime until they aggregate to a very high degree. So we're, we're good there. Uh, what we get out of it is the absolute weight average molecular weight. The second virial coefficient, which some people denote as B22 and others as A2, but second virial coefficient. And then the, uh, well, we don't get radius gyration, but now with dynamic light scattering, what you get is a diffusion coefficient. You do not get a hydrodynamic radius. You get a diffusion coefficient. And from that, you can use what we call the spherical chicken. If you were gonna model a chicken, what would you do? You say, well, let's take it first as a sphere. So uh, this is the Stokes-Einstein equation here that relates capital D, that's diffusion coefficient, to the hydrodynamic radius R sub H via the viscosity eta of the liquid and then pulse viscosity times temperature. And if you look at the scattering uh, on the right-hand side, for dynamic light scattering in purple, you can see it fluctuating. And while that might look like noise, it's not. It's actually related to the diffusion, mutual diffusion of particles uh, changing the interference pattern at your detector. That gets autocorrelated and gives a diffusion coefficient. Very different from what uh, uh, total intensity light scattering looks at the size of that signal see the double-headed arrow, that's measuring a certain amount of intensity. Uh, and that's what gives us the absolute weight average molecular weight and the second bureau coefficient. Also, we designed the instrument so as not to have those fluctuations or competing. Uh, dynamic light scattering, you want a very small uh, scattering volume and with static, you want a larger one. Next, please. Okay, so this uh, Arjun uh, is, is really, uh, best suited for watching processes where you have a change in time. Again, we can do equilibrium, I'll show that, but uh, down the bottom here, going from left to right, you can see the total intensity of the light scattering. That's the Rayleigh ratio, I sub R, as a function of time. This is for polymerizing, with the free radical polymerization of acrylamide, uh, doing different concentrations and uh, different effects. If you look at the uh, bottom ones that have an inflection point, for example, we didn't purge uh, the oxygen out with nitrogen. So you have oxygen scavenging the radicals from the initiator until they finally takes off. I won't go into that anymore. The degradation of hyaluronic acid in the uh, center, we're changing the substrate concentration of hyaluronic acid. I'll come back to this briefly later to see how we get the, the Kalis uh, menten that parameters out of that. And what we're more focused on then is the uh, thermal or aggregation of monoclonal antibodies. So let's go to the next. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we can skip that last one because Alex already went over that. So go, go to the next one, please. Yeah, and then, so first look at equilibrium characterization without any aggregation at all. So what we're measuring here is, again, the absolute total intensity light scattering, the Rayleigh ratio as a function of the monoclonal antibody concentration. It goes pretty close to 200 milligrams per milliliter. So this is quite dense. Beautiful material, and we published this so it's open. We did this work with Biogen, uh, it's all open literature. Uh, beautiful solutions, they're perfectly crystal clear all the way up to 200 milligrams per milliliter, as they should be, only if you have aggregation or impurities would you get any cloudiness in there. So, uh, wait, um, could you just go back, please? All right, well, we can stay. <laughs> no. Uh, no, can we go backwards? Now, yeah, one more back, please. Thank you. Okay. So what's interesting here, if you look at the curve on the right-hand side, as you concentrate the solution, it actually comes up to a maximum and then starts going down, which is kind of counterintuitive. 
but going down means that you have very strong repulsive interactions between the molecules. The virial coefficients A2, those are two body interactions, A3 are three body interactions. Um, so those are highly repulsive and that's good. They repel each other, they don't stick. So if you go to the next slide, next please. Okay, uh, don't wanna go into too much detail here, but remember the second virial coefficient, if you look at in this column is the two body interaction. And we have a, a NIST, that's the National Institute of Standards of Technology in the US. They now have a standard monoclonal antibody. It's very stable. This is one of uh, Biogen's here, which is also stable and commercially available. This is one that they abandoned here, the MABB. It's unstable. If you look at the virial coefficients for the stable ones, they're on the order of 10 to the minus fourth, whereas it's like 10 to the minus six. So you have a very low virial coefficient, which means they don't repel each other too effectively. And interestingly, if you look on the left-hand side, both the stable NIST monoclonal antibody and the uh, stable uh, biogen come to a maximum, whereas the unstable one is going up in a straight line. You can see it all the way to the left because it has very weak interaction. So this is uh, uh, one way of characterizing propensity to aggregation without actually looking at aggregation itself. Now, we're more interested in, in the kinetics, so let's move on to the next. Here's the, okay, th this is a very naive uh, depiction of aggregation. There are many different uh, mechanisms and routes to can take, but this would be one where you partially unfold it and you expose hydrophobic and other uh, sticky domains, uh, microstatic dipoles and so on. Uh, and then they encounter each other and they stick together and this process might continue a large amount of aggregation or it might stop at a dimer or an octamer or whatever. So there are many different things that can happen. Uh, next, please. Yeah, okay. So you already saw on the bottom of the other um, slide. Oop, oop, please go back. Back to the last one, please. Yes, that, right there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so you stay there for a minute. Uh, so here we have the... Uh, Need to go back, please. Thank you. Okay, so notice we have a logarithmic time scale. That's out to five days uh, at 30 degrees. And you can see as a function of temperature, uh, it gets very quickly goes unstable. But notice that the stability, is it, it is time dependent. So it's not like there's any single temperature at which aggregation starts. And now I regret not having that slide here because a lot of people talk about an aggregation temperature. There is no such thing as an aggregation temperature. If you do a ramp, and we can do ramps with Argen, you will abruptly see uh, the, the aggregation occurring at a certain temperature, but it's completely dependent upon the ramp speed. So if you ramp for 24 hours, you come up with a, a lower temperature than if you ramp it more quickly, it can be as much as 20 degrees. Anyway, didn't wanna preach too much about that, but it's true that there's no aggregation temperature. So you can see at each temperature, you get a different kinetics. This is a log-log scale, uh, but basically you see at 30 degrees, completely stable out to five or six days, 45 is starting to go up. By the time you're at 83, in a matter of tens of seconds, you're highly aggregated. Okay, next please. Uh, so one thing just to compare the in total intensity light scattering with the dynamic light scattering, the dynamic light scatter remember, is measuring the uh, hydrodynamic diameter via really the measurement of the diffusion coefficient. And we can see if we look as a function of molecular weight of the aggregates, this is on the left-hand side is dynamic light scattering data. The hydrodynamic di diameter is going up is the square root of the mass of the aggregate. Uh, and that's typical of a random coil, it's indicating that protein unfolds into a random coil and also aggregates like one. So if you look on the right-hand side, you see the MW over M0 at top, that's the total intensity light scattering, which is directly proportional to the molecular weight. And then below it, the uh, equivalent dynamic light scattering. So you see that the total intensity is quite exquisitely sensitive to the aggregation process, where the, whereas the DLS is, it's, it's a duller um, effect because it's only a fractional power. Next, please. Okay, so in order to quantify this, so we have some real numbers. Can you go back, please? Back, thank you. Oh, 
Here we go, right here. Sit up. If you could stay on that last one, please. Not this one, the last one, going backwards. There you go, thank you. Okay, that MW over M0, that's a normalized molecular weight. So it starts at one, that's the unaggregated protein at time T equals zero. Uh, as time goes on and aggregation uh, continues, uh, we get some kind of a signature. Often there's a linear initial quotient, not always, but usually. If we take the slope of that ratio with respect to time, uh, it gives us the rate of increase. So uh, the slope here is 0 0.0049. It means you get half a percent increase in molecular weight per second. So that we get that number, this aggregation rate in inverse seconds. If you go to the next now, we can make an Arrhenius plot. You see uh, on the right-hand side, the that derivative, that is the aggregation rate versus reciprocal temperature and you get these curves. So remember, the smaller the aggregation rate, the more stable. And you'll see that the NIST monoclonal antibody is the champion there. It's very stable compared to the other. And notice it's a logarithmic scale. So we're talking about orders of magnitude difference in the aggregation rates. If you look at MABA, that's the stable biogen monoclonal antibody. It's a couple orders of magnitude less stable than NIST, but it's stable enough for uh, commercialization. Whereas their unstable one, that's the one in, in purple above it, uh, you can see it's a couple orders of magnitude worse and they abandoned that one. The one up above was some friends uh, from the university and, yeah. and very unstable. Uh, yeah. Now, what's interesting is that the, the slope of those is the activation energy and notice that on the bottom three, they're the same. So that activation energy is not a clue as to stability. And that's interesting. So what it's really saying is that, uh, you know, the unfolding is happening very similarly in these cases, but the aggregation depends. Could you go back, please? Back. No? All right. Well, nope. <laughs> yeah. It, it depends on how the uh, hydro hydrophobic poles of the protein are displayed when it's unaggregated and the quality of the solution and it's ranked the pH, any excipients, and so on. Okay, next, please. So one thing uh, that we would all like to do is accelerated testing, so we don't have to wait a year or 10 years to figure out if something is going to be stable over a time period. So there's a temptation to want to extrapolate, and so if we take our data, uh, this graph here is how many days it takes to dimerize, average dimerization time, uh, versus temperature, please stay on that last one. The last one. That, no, no. That's it. That's it. Uh, and if you go and just, no. The next one, please. Yeah. Now, if you just take and do the. Um, if you could stay on that last one, please. There. Yeah, thank you. If you just do a direct extrapolation, that's the dashed line, to 40 degrees and below, which is the pharmaceutically interesting temperature regime, you can see that it predicts fantastic stability. At room temperature, this would this would last for you know a few thousand years, like as old as you know, time back to the betas. Or if you go down to a modest 15 degrees C, you'd be like at the age of the earth, and pretty soon you're at the big bang. So it's way off. It's way off because what we find, don't forget this is a log scale being predicted here as many years of stability is actually only a couple weeks. So the extrapolation breaks down. Okay, let's move on. Next, please. Thank you. Okay, I won't dwell on this, but this shows the principle uh, just mentioned that the aggregation rate, this is the same protein or body, but different formulations. So here's a case where the ionic strength and pH has a very big effect on the aggregation right showed is the inset and then the kinetics you can see there. We'll get into any details, but it's the same protein under different solution conditions at the same temperature of 60 C. Next, please. Okay, so now stirring. Now th this is um, interesting. Uh, if you go to the next one, please. Okay, please look at the picture on the upper right-hand side. 
you'll see that we have two ways we're stirring. The cells to the right, which are cloudy, have little stir bars on the bottom. So it's contact stirring, whereas on the left-hand side, they're suspended uh, and they're spun with the uh, magnetic stir of the argent itself, uh, but they're not touching anything. And what you see is they, they both ran for like 24 hours and the ones on the right that had contact got really cloudy. Uh, whereas the ones on the left, nothing at all happened. So it's not uh, a hydrodynamic shear phenomenon. It's more of a grinding phenomenon in that um, stir bar at the bottom. And then if you look at the origin data on the lower left-hand side, you can see that the one where they were suspended, no contact, it remained stable in time. Again, it was not the um, hydrodynamic fluid field doing it. If you look at the contact stir, you can see a very big effect and that's due to the, the contact. Uh, over here is the GPC. They were displaced a little so you could see them. Uh, after 24 hours, well, th there's no uh, aggregates in the non-contact stir. The one that showed it, a very large amount of aggregation on the left-hand side shows no aggregation on the GPC. In other words, we formed a very small population, very small, but of large aggregates. So that we can distinguish, um, whereas the GPC can't even detect that level of aggregates. They get filtered out, basically. Uh, and there's very little monomer that went into it. Okay, next. Thank you. So now the re... Yeah, right there. Stick there, please. Um, now, the reproducibility is, is a big issue. Again, I mentioned, you know, when you have aggregation, that's intrinsically a horrible phenomenon. How is it ever going to reproduce? So we set out to figure out um, what types of stressors would be reproducible oh. if any, uh, and which would be more stochastic. Uh -huh. So, you know, first of all, we make this um, statement here that a measuring device yeah. cannot be used to determine whether a process is deterministic. And that's because the instrument always has its own in instrument error distribution, which is um, a sum of the different errors associated with it. With the Argen, it's you know, temperature, which is actually very well controlled. That's not a, a big factor, but it's there. Give some width and then stray light, a reinsertion of a, of, of a vial um, and various other effects all sum up to give that distribution you see there. That's for the origin. So if you repeat experiments many time and times and the distribution of the results falls on or within that inherent instrument, instrument error distribution, you're operationally deterministic. This is as deterministic as you can tell with that instrument. So go to the next, please. There we go. So on the left-hand side, we're looking again at the normalized molecular weight. It's a function of time. The lower, the lower one is BSA at 50HC. The upper one is a, another monoclonal antibody at 70 degrees C. What you can see is they're very uh, tightly packed for each group. And if we go over on the right-hand side, there the, the, the black Gaussian again is the inherent instrument distribution. And you look at the results, this is summed up from like, I think 80 different measurements. Um, and you can see the distribution, it does indeed fall on the width of the instrument. So within uh, the limitations of the instrument, uh, temperature aggregation for both of these proteins is deterministic and reproducible. So it's not random. Now, if we go to the next, on the left-hand side, now this is with contact stir, and we already saw the results with contact stir made the solution cloudy, but it was a very small population of large aggregates. What you see is that it really is all over the map. And so it's not uh, reproducible. It's ballpark reproducible, but not highly so. And if you, uh, Look on the right-hand side, again, the black Gaussian in the center is the instrument, and then the other measurements are spread around it. You can see we're outside the instrument uh, error distribution, so it is not, not operationally deterministic. It is very much stochastic. And the difference is, remember with temperature, that's a global stressor. It affects every molecule in your solution, whereas uh, stirring is a local stressor. It's just stressing the molecules that are nearby and that's what's leading to this um, stochastic result here. Okay, uh, and we could do that for other stressors and other proteins. It gives us a way of determining, is this really a reproducible aggregation phenomenon or is it stochastic? Next, please. 
Uh, and so I mentioned that uh, we're looking at the initial linear regime to get an aggregation rate. But if, uh, as you watch in time, it's usually not linear. It'll start to define itself as something else. The one on the left, for example, you can see it as a positive second derivative, derivative it's concave upwards. Uh, and that's a hallmark of a cooperative aggregation process. The more it aggregates, the more it wants to aggregate. And so it runs away and will finally precipitate. Whereas the one in the center, you can see that it, it actually limits out and it limits out at two. In other words, it just dimerizes and stops. Uh, and the one on the right-hand side is anti-cooperative. You see it has a negative second derivative. It's concave downward. In other words, it gets harder to aggregate the more proteins it aggregates unto itself. So there we get different uh, mechanisms spelled out with the kinetics. Okay, next please. Uh, by the way, we did that last one with Chris Roberts and his group in Delaware. Uh, so this idea of the mechanism being apparent in the nonlinear signature can be tested because clearly you have a whole series of rate equations with uh, uh, temperature dependent constants. Now, if we take uh, these different temperatures here, 78 to 84 C for a monoclonal antibody, we can scale the time. And here are the scaling factors on the right hand side. You can see 0 0.5, 3.89, 3 3.11. They all come together into a universal curve. This means the entire aggregation uh, kinetics is shifting cooperative or in the same way. What was the best word? Uh, commensurately, the kinetic parameters are shifting commensurately with temperature, so you get a universal curve. So it's the same mechanism. Now, if you go to the next, thank you. Uh, and we look in the upper left, you can see that if you're below 63 or at 63 and then 75, they are somewhat different now. They don't go on to a universal curve. So there's actually some difference in the mechanism that's, that's taking hold between those two temperatures. Whereas if you look in the, uh, the bottom curve here, the uh, blue one is for uh, temperature aggregation, curving upward, it looks cooperative. And the red one, which is almost straight, is contact stir. You can see they, have, they can't superpose at all. So it's a very different kinetic mechanism. In fact, we already discussed that. The contact stir is a local stressor and temperature is a global stressor. Next, please. Okay, particulates. We can go to the next. Yeah, oops, back one, please. Thank you. Uh, on the left-hand side, we're looking again at the normalized molecular weight starting at one, and it's going up, and looks like the signal's getting noisier. You know, the, the bandwidth is increasing there, but if you actually pull a little swath out, and this is a full day's data, if you just pull out 500 seconds, you know, nine minutes, eight and a half minutes, and connect the dots, literally, you can see that these are all little peaks, and those peaks are actually single particles. So we call it particulation. You've gone from having like dimers and octamers into actual like colloidal particles, uh, and we've estimated uh, about 150 nanometers of a uh, protein aggregate. They'll start to peak their head above the continuous scattering level uh, and, and give us individual peaks. And what you can see is early in the aggregation, the peaks are fairly small, so the particles are small. And then the particulates get bigger, taken out toward the end, they're actually very large. So we have a way of monitoring the uh, evolution of the particulates in the solution. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, here, if you drill down even further, uh, you can see that these blip, here are the individual blips. They're actually Gaussian. It's just a you know, quaint fact that uh, the laser beam itself has a Gaussian intensity profile. So when a particle goes through it on any trajectory, it will yield a Gaussian. And so those are the individual peaks very clean, uh, clearly uh, shown here as Gaussians. In fact, those are fits to Gaussians. That's real data and the Gaussians fit them very well. Okay, next, please. Um, I'll just, just a quick word on this. Uh, some of you might be involved because my polyp was it, uh, N isopropyl acrylamide uh, forms temperature sensitive uh, polymer. 
which has a, a lower critical solution temperature, and it is biocompatible, so it's it's useful in biopharma uh, as a homopolymer. Now here we're doing a ramp. Remember, I cautioned against ramps for proteins because there is no aggregation temperature. However, in the case of NIPAM, there's a genuine phase transition from a, a stable random coil at low temperature. When you heat it, you cooperatively disrupt the hydrogen bonds and it becomes hydrophobic and it, it collapses to a globule and then aggregates. So you can see very cleanly uh, on that left hand where it says homopolymer, uh, a very well-defined temperature for a phase transition. That's real. It's not an aggregation temperature, it's a real phase transition. Uh, and then as we start to uh, vary the composition, we, we take NIPAM and copolymerize it with acrylamid you can see a 70-30 there. It's actually a lot of composition drift, so it's not only 70-30, there's a whole bunch of compositions and they all go off at different temperatures. So you can see where you had that nice sharp NIPAM uh, phase transition on the left-hand side going to a more smeared out one. And then when we really went to town and we did a semi-batch ramp, so we went uh, all the way from like pure uh, NIPAM to pure acrylamide and everything in between, you really stretch out the uh, transitions, you had all those representations of different copolymer composition in there. Okay, uh, next please. So some other things just to mention that I won't show data for because of time is uh, we're working with immunologists now in vaccine formulations and they use adjuvant proteins. Uh, so we've been uh, looking at the uh, at, um, you know aggregation kinetics and stabilities of the adjuvants. Something uh, we found fairly shocking, I'm not sure if this is wholly true, y'all would know much better than I, uh, is that whereas it, with monoclonal antibodies, we're trying to uh, minimize or even eliminate aggregation, it seems that our immunologist colleagues like the ag aggregation, they said that you know, it makes a larger uh, target particle for the, for the cytokines and the antibodies uh, to target, and so it actually enhances the efficiency of the vaccine. Now, don't kill the messenger. That's just what they told me. Um, so they actually want to see the aggregation. I thought it was interesting. Uh, we've been looking at RNA polymerization kinetics under different uh, scenarios. Uh, also with lipid nanoparticle uh, carriers for RNA uh, for delivery. Uh, another thing uh, very recently. So what we've been monitoring is aggregation, not unfolding. We're looking at unfolding following, followed by aggregation. But are there cases in which you have unfolding where it doesn't aggregate? Uh, so we've been working with um, another group uh, who's been doing a lot of work with ubiquitin, uh, which is small, but it's highly charged. So if you keep it at low, uh, low pH, about 2.3, where it's highly charged and put no salt in, so there's no ionic shielding, uh, which you actually see, this is quite interesting, uh, it unfolds but does not aggregate because there's so much repulsion between the proteins. So what we see instead of us uh, light scattering going up, it actually goes down. And it goes down because the virial coefficient A2 or B22 goes up because of the uh, expansion of the molecule in the unfolded state. So it's really a, a, an interesting effect. The scattering goes down in the case of non-aggregative unfolding. And now we're looking at its reversibility and how far, you know, we're doing no ionic strength. How far can we push that and still not get, not get aggregation? Uh, another project is viral capsid release uh, DNA. Uh, this is in its infancy, but it's proving to be very interesting. Is it the uh, unfolding of the protein capsid that's uh, releasing it, or is it the DNA denaturing and you know outgrowing its uh, its capsid environment? Uh, that's a work in progress too. Okay, next please. Getting toward the end. Uh, I wanted to mention this. Uh, before concluding, because uh, it's something uh, we've been working on. It's not a product yet. Uh, we've done you know, one little prototype, but the idea is not to go into bio biopharmaceutical manufacturing into the process line itself. And you can see this instrument on the right. It's a, it's a multi-detector insert. So it'll go right into your process line. It'll have this disposable insert, which is sterile. You just throw it away, it's cheap, it's sterile, you throw it away after each use. Uh, and it matches, its inner diameter matches the inner diameter of your flow tubing, so it does not disturb the flow path in any way, nor is any sampling required. So your process is flowing straight on through, and we're looking at the, uh, the light scattering we've been talking about, we're looking at multi-angle light scattering, we're looking at um, 
depolarized light scattering, which I didn't go into at all here, but you can get a lot of information from that as well. And then uh, fluorescence detector, so you can see the state of unfolding and then UV detection so you can get concentration. So it's, and this will be about 10 centimeters long. Uh, and so in real time in quality control, we should be able to see particle content unfolding versus native state, concentration of protein and so on. So we'll have a full panel on the left side, you see the, uh, the panel of parameters uh, we would be getting out of this. So that's something we're looking for, you know, interested partners in further development. Okay, uh, I think the last, next one concludes with the summary, um, you know, just to say we've been looking at continuous quantitative kinetics. Uh, and remember, we can, go, we can go to very high concentrations. We were up to 20% or 200 milligrams per milliliter uh, with nice uh, protein. A lot of manufacturers are interested in that so they can give high dosages of protein and not have a person sit under a diluted drip for an hour or more at a time. Um, and we saw global stressors versus local stressors and the implication for reproducibility of aggregation versus stochastic aggregation. Um, yeah, we saw the, the disappointment of trying to directly extrapolate uh, high temperature data into the pharmaceutically interesting regime below 40C. You get, we're off by millennia, literally millennia uh, in doing that. Um, then the SMS uh, looking at the particulates, being able to see them form and getting some idea of how big they are and how dense they are. And then uh, mentioning some of the uh, applications uh, beyond proteins. And with that, I conclude and thank you all very much for taking the time to listen. Thank you, Professor Reed for uh, the wonderful uh, you know, outline and uh, the description of the technology. I now request, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Venkut, uh, Dr. Satyam, uh, Samir, as well as Dr. Naurat uh, to, uh, you know, start a discussion um, on this particular uh, presentation. Uh, post this discussion, we will have certain question answer session which are coming uh, from the audience. So, uh, uh, Satyam, may I start from you? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Dr. Reed. That was very interesting. I appreciate your presentation. It certainly seems like this has the potential to be used significantly in a lot of comparability studies. Uh, when I look at the kind of uh, data you have presented, uh, either be it the thermal or the agitation, uh, and it could be the pH also, what it gives us is it gives me a tool to actually look at protein uh, stability, aggregation, uh, under conditions for which we, where we are trying to make a process change, we are trying to change a facility, we are trying to add a new uh, you know, scale to our operations. So this gives us a very good tool and I think it's, it's really, really useful. Uh, I know Venkat had a, a point to discuss earlier, so I'm gonna ask Venkat to bring up his point that we had spoken about earlier. Venkat? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so this, I, I think certainly, uh, thanks Professor Reed uh, for the nice presentation. Um, so this certainly has an application in the formulation development. There is a kind of, you know, there is no doubt. Uh, one of the aspect I'm actually curious to see, uh, you are actually kind of, you know, there is a point, I think I have seen, I think 150 nanometers is the minimum size or something for the limit for this particular technology uh, to detect the aggregates. So especially I wanted to see whether this can be used to see the, for example, peptides. So you require a certain uh, kind of an oligomeric state. It need to be achieved. Uh, before actually like, you know, to in order to uh, kind of that need to be effective, especially for the uh, peptide formulations. So can this technology to be used in terms of the developing the formulation development? That's the one question. The other thing is, it's a very interesting phenomenon. I have seen that that's the, something like, you know, it's a news to me. That's the contact versus non-contact. I think uh, 
uh, there also i want you to shed more light on to the thing why size exclusion will not be able to do that if there is a something i do see a cloudy solution over there gel permeation when you go for the size exclusion there certainly there will be a drop in the total area so you may not totally see the kind of an increase in the aggregate but there is a way once you see between the untreated versus treated there will be a drop in the area so i'll stop it here and then post that maybe i can actually take up a follow up question on that okay um i just realized there's a slide missing there a gpc slide unfortunately uh, hope but i fixed here the professor uh, to, address, to address your question though um, there was actually no drop in the area of the monomer peak for this uh, contact stirred material indicating that the population of those aggregates was so small in terms of percentage of mass that it was unmeasurable, the drop in monomer content. And apparently the GPC college also filtered that out. Otherwise we would have had a massive light scattering spike uh, in the GPC. So that's what's going on there. We, we will not see the monomer drop because it's such a tight, we're, we're looking at less than 1% drop in population by mass. Um, so that, that's what's happening there. That's why we cannot see the GPC by a decrease in monomer area. Also, um, when you mentioned the 150 nanometers that I had mentioned, just, just to be clear, that's for uh, particulates for seeing those uh, Gaussian spikes from individual particles. What we're saying is if you get up to about 150 nanometers, we can actually see an individual particle by its spike. Of course, the native proteins we're looking at with a nice clear signal are only about you know, eight to 10 nanometers in diameter. So uh, the 150 nanometers is just a particulates. So we're usually not looking at that. We're looking at the native protein, which is eight, 10 nanometers, and then you know, dimers and octamers uh, and, and so on. And another slide I did not show is sensitivity where we could discern three dimers amidst a thousand uh, native uh, protein molecules. A very sensitive to small amounts of uh, aggregation. So yes, that was your first question. Uh, we think it's useful in formulation because we can see down to the native proteins and very small amounts of aggregation amidst the proteins. I, also add, I would also add, so given that, that limit uh, of detection, we have done a number of peptide applications with uh, a couple of companies. So uh, the sensitivity is definitely there to see that aggregation change from your starting point peptide to an aggregated peptide. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Alex, that was somehow that slide with the GPC where we would see, um, Dr. Venkat was saying that if we do uh, thermal instability of the proteins and then follow it with GPC, you very clearly see the monomer peak go down and turn into the uh, aggregate peaks because again it's a global stressor the whole population is involved and it's a large amount at the end there's almost no native protein left and that's in contradistinction to this uh, contact stir where you couldn't even detect the um, decrease in uh, total concentration okay thank you thank you so any other question from Samir or Navratna? Yeah, actually, thank you, for, first of all, Dr. Van, for uh, presenting a good, uh, having a good presentation for uh, on this, as well as I just want to, uh, as this instrument is very useful for not only for the formulation development, it is also useful for, you can say, temperature exclusion study when we want to submit any of the, uh, any of the data to FDA for proving that whether the, our formulation change or whatever we have done, it will be useful or it will be uh, not hampering anything in logistics. So temperature absorption or any other aggregation studies. So this is very useful. And also it will, uh, this instrument will be useful for when I say in process sample, which are the steps you can say is increasing any aggregates or not. So to study this type of thing online, yes, this uh, will be helpful. So it will be very helpful thing. Good. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, You're muted. Yeah. Uh, Navrat. Are you audible? Navrat is muted. 
Okay. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Now we can. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Uh, my question is in. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you, Professor Reed. Thank you, Alex, for a nice presentation. Uh, my question is in continuation of uh, Samir's question. So, you have uh, in the last one of the last slide you talked about uh, in process analytics that how you measure or you can measure uh, the aggregation content online while the process is on. So. i wanted to know whether uh, what is the sensitivity at that level because you would be having multiple kind of in process impurities also present at that time so how would you judge actually whether the aggregation is coming out of my main product or is it coming out of the impurities what kind of impurities would i mean these are protein variants coming out of cells Oh, oh, oh! You mean like fragments of organelles and yes. things like that? Yes. It, it, this is a, so. Originally, we were thinking at the fill stage. You know, when you go okay. um, uh, from drug uh, material to uh, the final drug product. Uh, so we we're thinking more downstream, like when you do the compounding in the tank, and then you, you know, move through filtration from filtration to fill. We would be watching this because all those are potential aggregation traps. Uh, we'd be watching the state of aggregation as you go there. Now, if you move further upstream, uh, when Alex had some uh, of the employees doing uh, marketing research, uh, I think a lot of them said they would actually like to also adapt it um, upstream. Alex, can you say something about that? Yeah. So the biggest place where we saw interest. uh and this is just to be clear that is a prototype technology that we're working on uh okay. separate from the argent system so the argent system gave us the foundation for you know the aggregation studies and we learned a lot about the space and because we do online analytics with uh our other technology in petrochemical we said well what if we could develop something for that so that's what we're talking about now um the the biggest application we saw interest in was actually at the protein application stage so going from that material and then seeing that uh material loss through each filtration step because there was an opportunity there from the feedback we had we're not experts in biomarker manufacturing but the feedback was that uh if you can optimize that process uh you can optimize your yield uh so that was the biggest interest there and then like Wayne noted uh also kind of later stage more of a QA for uh filling and downstream. Um yeah, upstream there was also a lot of people that there were also a lot of people that were interested in actually analyzing that in the bioreactors themselves yes. uh even before. Now that is a, a much different more complex issue because of all those impurities in there. Uh so yeah, I think it would be great. We just don't know yet enough about that process and if what well, I'd like to come back to the rapidness uh you know original statement about the impurities so like if it is say the fragments of organelles those should give massive gaussian peaks so i think there is a potential for distinguishing between what's a protein aggregate and what's something much bigger but i think it would be uh, you know you get a colossal peak versus the kinds of ones you saw there uh, so i think this promise okay uh, i have one more question so when you compare your results with a technology called auc or sec how comparable are your results actually what what i'm not sure if i know those techniques analytical ultra centrifugation or oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay yeah analytical ultra centrifugation and what was the other one and sec size exclusion oh, chromatography oh, yeah 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 yes um so it, taking that ladder one first uh, we do a lot of gpc or sec in fact we even give a course on that in my lab each year um three three day intensive course uh it's as you see a excellent complement to it and i regret not having that slide in it it was originally but uh so for example the smsls is a very nice tool for deciding when to sample for gpc because gpc or sec is ultimately Uh, a discrete process it takes you you know at least 10 minutes or more to go through the column and get your data uh and so you know how often do you inject when is it worthwhile more of a complement to that and then the other thing is you know you can pick up aggregates with 
the SMSLS that you can't get through your columns. In fact, it don't even constitute a large uh, fraction of the material, but could be very pyrogenic nonetheless. Now, the other one, analytical ultracentric negation, I think that knocks it out of the park, isn't that? Uh, in my naive knowledge of modern biology, isn't that like one of the main ways of separating out proteins, uh, the hundreds of thousands of different proteins and the, the proteome and, uh, you know, and that's exquisitely designed to separate the, according to mass and, and so on. So that, that's completely, completely different the goal of that as terms of identification of new proteins or proteins you know should be in there, et cetera, versus us looking at aggregation. So again, I think it's that's a totally different space, whereas SEC is a complementary space. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Yeah. So thank you, uh, all the panelists, as well as, uh, you know, as speaker for uh, this particular interaction. Uh, before I, you know, take the questions which are coming from, uh, you know, audience, I'll probably ask uh, the panelist, which will also be a feedback to, uh, you know, Alex and Wayne Red, that if, uh, you know, bio, I mean, Indian biopharmaceutical industry is primarily a, a biosimilar industry. Most of our requirements, most of our efforts are going towards development of biosimilars. So how, what is your perspective, you know, it's a very open perspective, which is also a feedback to both of them and to the Fluence team. What is your perspective that, you know, what are the chances of having such technology uh, or what kind of data do we need? Uh, so this technology can be viable alternative for, uh, so we are using size exclusion chromatography, which is the first thing. Then it goes to dynamic light scattering, AF4, AUC, uh, then if, you know, things are not really sorted, we go for, you know, mass spectroscopy and multiple other uh, different techniques to understand aggregates. Uh, but light scattering becomes a very critical tool uh, in, in this current circumstances. So uh, my request to uh, Satyam, Navrat, Navenkat and Samir is uh, to give a perspective, a very open perspective that what is needed, uh, what, what probably needs to be done. Is it sufficient or there would be definitely certain improvement uh, which, which can be possible? So uh, now that I, I may start from you. Thank you, thank you, Ratnesh. Um, so Professor Wayne, I think uh, one of the, so while uh, Ratnesh correctly pointed out that a lot of these techniques um, which we use day in day out in our uh, laboratories for evaluating aggregates, uh, but I still think there's a lot of potential because we still do not understand aggregates very well. Despite all these technologies which are present, but more so, uh, one of the major applications where I think uh, your technology will definitely is uh, monitoring them online, actually, especially downstream where you think you can actually help us or your technology can actually help us or guide us. Say upstream, I still think challenge because of the reasons you mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes back. Downstream, still there is a lot of scope. We uh, at times, we lose uh, our products also because of aggregation and uh, uh, the batches fails. And yes. if we get uh, right information at right time, probably uh, that will certainly help us in not or stopping the process at right time, relocate it mm. and uh, identify right conditions. So from my angle or I think that would be a wonderful way of introducing your instrument uh, right in the downstream stage to, to correct ourselves. That is my perspective of looking at uh, SML, SMSLS as a technical tool. And one comment on that, we, we did think that uh, this could be used to select vial by vial or syringe by syringe, you know, if you should reject or, or fill. I mean, it probably is going to be more like, you know, you got a wave of aggregates coming through and you'll be detected, you'll be rejecting them. You will not be filling vials or syringes. When it clears up, you'll see that automatically resume uh, filling. That, that was one of the ideas. It sounds like what you were talking about. Um, I, I have one more actually question to ask. Uh, so we, uh, or a lot of uh, proteins also are, uh, or at least marketed products are also available as suspensions. Uh, sometimes it is very really confusing whether your product is actually a suspension or is it actually aggregated. So 
how do you distinguish or how can you distinguish such kind of cases or it, do you think your technique has a potential to distinguish between the those two uh, i'm not sure what you mean by suspensions you, you mean colloid particles uh, in suspension or so uh, professor reed if i may uh, you know reframe the question the question which uh, navratna is trying to ask uh, that when uh, the post i mean post marketing when the product actually goes into market uh these uh, so like insulin insulin is a suspension yeah. now if insulin become aggregated do we have any or whether the the uh, the technology which you are proposing have capability to distinguish between a aggregated suspension or suspension so insulin which is primarily a suspension as well so you're talking about so this is new to me i, I didn't know insulin was actually aggregated in its commercial form i thought it was a no if so, it's it's both, <laughs> so insulin is available both as a suspension and also as a soluble uh, uh, formulation so suspension yeah. you you actually add certain excipients to to present it as a form as a suspension formulation so my question is sometimes uh, your your suspension formulation can undergo an aggregation so it is very difficult otherwise to measure the those kind of formulations to check whether the aggregation has happened or not happened so my question is whether is it possible actually using your technology to understand whether it is still in a suspension formulation or it has aggregated in the suspension formulation yeah i i would think so simply because you're we're directly measuring molecular weight so the on aggregated suspension will have a, a signature you know, this is where it should be there'll be a range and if it aggregates it'll be a lot more you know outside of that range so we could probably put you know specs on the uh, suspension versus an aggregated suspension thank you thank you thank you so uh, ratnish uh, i just have a one point here uh, hope you have a time there uh, yeah 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 we'll be yeah so this is see i do see certainly the techno i think you rightly pointed out in the biosimilar setting certainly it's an value add i think also the mostly this technology is aimed at uh, transitions in the pure pure molecule like you know once purification is done right once you have a mixture of molecules actually it's a different challenges so here the if you start with the purified molecule you can monitor the transitions but i also wanted to see when you are actually monitoring the aggregate transition does it also tell us actually it goes through the oligomer and then higher order and all will it be able to decipher that if you deconvolute that entire your scattering and all what you are getting will that actually gives us the monomer goes to the dimer oligomer and subsequently that also will help us to understand the aggregation kinetics so yes. i don't know i just wanted to see whether uh, dr uh, reed can shed some light on that so certainly i'm as i said uh, it has a kind of you know power of utilize checking the multiple samples today you can do with the current existing setup and all in the batch mode but in this case i believe it's a 16 samples can be done a lot of these things with the various conditions and all you can expose and you can assimilate the data in a short time so that uh, that has a power i certainly see there is some applicability the another thing is uh, how long is this particular thing is being used in the industry that's the next follow up question or is it mostly used in the academic setting okay the first question um i think you're asking about oligomerization can we see you know dimerization octamerization prior to some like massive onset is is that what you're asking yes in fact if you remember when i showed the nonlinear signatures the center example was of a dimerization we watched the normalized mass go from one which is pure native to two which means you have a dimer and it, and it ended there did not keep going now uh, i mentioned that paper we did with chris roberts group in delaware uh and there it was really interesting because we would see a a tetramerization very clearly and once it hit that then it would take off as a colloid a massive colloid uh aggregation so uh yeah we can see different phases like dimerization octamerization uh and then if it goes on to colloid aggregate we would we would see that as well uh we're also seeing it with the viral capsids uh we would actually see a decrease in the molecular weight apparently that was the shedding of the dna from the capsid uh followed by a massive colloidal aggregation either of the capsid proteins which had denatured or uh, uh, DNA. We're not sure yet. We're still working on that project. 
Thank you. Yeah, we should be able to get your diversification. And to the second point about adoption, yeah, yeah initially this was uh, obviously academic applications. In the past couple of years, we have seen a few more uh, customers in the uh, industrial application. So it is starting just in the most very, very recent times to be adopted uh, in the industry. So it's still very early and we are still trying to frame it, as you've noted, for the right types of applications uh, so that the value is clear and people can understand how to use the system to improve their development process. So uh, all the feedback is very welcome. Thank you. So Satyam, maybe Satyam, Samir, any one of you? In continuation with, uh, you can say, Dr. Navratna, what has said for the downstream also, it's like recovery matters a lot when I say there are so many aggregates are found in different different steps. So if we'll get to know like what are, what are the things which are increasing the aggregation at downstream level, whether storing container or whatever. So if that thing, if we can identify with this uh, instrument, then that would be very helpful. Because uh, as I think so, Dr. Van also uh, given some uh, contact and not, con not contact story. So that is creating a different, uh, and which is not identified by the SSE, but it is only identified with this SSL, SLS MS, so if that type of thing will come into picture, yes, this will be very helpful for a biosimilar uh, industry for improving their products at early stage only. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right Thank about you. that. Thank um, you. Yeah. yeah. Satyam, maybe from your side and before we sure. take a couple of more questions, yeah. Yeah, so I actually don't have a question, but I think I can certainly say that from a biosimilar uh, perspective, uh, from what uh, the presentation was about, the ability to do accelerated conditions uh, to do comparability, that for me was a very critical aspect because uh, when we are developing the process uh, and we continue to change certain parameters, it becomes very critical for us to be able to get a quick read uh, on how things are changing over time. And I can't keep my sample around for a long, long time uh, waiting for real-time stability. So accelerated stability samples becomes good. The mixing studies that we're talking about with the stir bar and that was interesting because for me, if I were to take that as a surrogate for a transport validation, that would be great because it gives me an idea on, on the vibrating conditions. How does a sample yes. behave? So there are there are things that we could exploit this machine. I think it depends on how you want to uh, to exploit the things. It's not so much about it being a perfect tool, but it's about the ability to use the tool for things that you can't do it in real time but you could actually do this in, in a lot faster way. So I think this, this is really nice and interesting. And uh, the more we use it, the better it be become at uh, exploiting it. Yeah, actually, there's lots of things you can do with it beyond its stock configuration. In fact, going back to Samir, um, what we were saying, yeah, we showed contact versus non-contact story, but for example, we've hooked these up to uh, recirculating peristaltic pumps, which are supposed to be benign, but no, they also damage the protein. And we think that's because, you know, the roller where the tubing goes, that's also a contact point, which is a local stressor and produces fairly large aggregates. And the other thing that we found out is that oftentimes filtration is counterproductive and causes aggregation as well. So those are the kinds of, you know, we can hook up external, you know, a little reservoir and be pumping through a, a cell uh, with peristaltic pump. Uh, we've used different materials, you know, like Teflon versus peak tubing versus stainless steel. Uh, there's many different kinds of things you can assess. And I think what Satyam was saying, you know, you can, uh, it's a platform. It's not just like a fixed measurement. It's like, let your imagination, you know, take hold and, and see how you can flexibly mold it to new problems. Yeah. So thank you everyone uh, for, you know, giving up a specto and very right questions. I think, uh, Couple of more questions which are coming from the audience, some are basic. So I'm just selecting a couple of them. Uh, it's not possible because of the time limitation to answer all the question. Uh, so there are two basic question to you, Alex. Uh, first is what is the size range uh, the aggregates can be identified by this particular instrumentation? And are you planning to also uh, go for certain kind of a regulatory uh, standards or compliance side? So are you going for the compliance side, which is also going to be primary requirement uh, in the industry? 
Uh, I can answer the compliance question. I'll let Wayne talk about the, uh, the sensitivity, of, you know. Yeah. Um, so what we've learned about the industry is that um, we will need some partners, especially users that are trying to um, push the technology to do the comparability and all those other studies for the validation and the compliance. Um, so we haven't personally done it. What we want to do is actually work with somebody and say, well, if we want to use it for comparability to you know, do a validation study against GPC or SEC, for example, that we would frame that up. Um, and then as we go through a regulatory process, be able to have that validation. But we have not, because we're not developing proteins ourselves, done that just yet. Um, so on, on our radar, but we haven't yet. And I'll let Wayne answer the uh, sensitivity question. Yeah. Right, so it's it's not size that we're measuring, it's uh, molecular uh, weight or molar mass. So, you know, the upward limit, uh, there's a couple of things I don't want to bore people, but it, as the part, we're doing 90 degree detection. So as the particle gets onto, you know, a couple hundred nanometers, uh, we would have to do extrapolation at zero angle, which we don't do. However, the native proteins are, are very good Rayleigh scatterers up to several million molecular weight, we're good. Really the bigger question is how low can we go? And so that's, um, we frequently get that question, but that really is a function of concentration. It's concentration of your protein times its molar mass, which determines how low we can go. Yeah. So if you pump up the concentration, you can go really low in mass, or if you, you know, pump up the mass and have low concentration, you can detect that too. Yeah. We have a little chart for determining that. So the question is basically if I have a, you know, peptide of, uh, you know, 2 KDA, 4 KDA, 10 KDA. So is with respect to higher molecular weight, are they going to be a larger, I mean, it's going to be a good scatterer. So it means the peptide drugs, which are lower molecular weight, say 2 KDA, 3 KDA, is it difficult uh, for the instrument to characterize the aggregation? Oh, no, actually, that's, that's a very good question because uh, it, depending on the type of aggregation, uh, a lot of them, they aggregate a lot. It's not just a dimerization or optimization. And so we've started with, uh, you, know, you know, like ubiquitins, 8,000. We've done things that are just a couple thousand because once they aggregate, they come clearly under the screen. They, they always blow it away. And by the same token, you can start at very low concentrations and you, you might not get, you know, great data if the native protein is really low concentration, like, 0.01 mg per mil, but once it starts aggregating, it comes on the screen very powerfully. Okay. Yeah. So the second question is, I mean, there are again two questions. The first question is, uh, if one has to quantify, how would you rate when you compare with uh, size exclusion chromatography, SEC? How much quantification, like DLS is a more qualitative technique. It's not a quantitative technique. So how would you rate your technology, whether, you know, how much quantification is possible? So that's a great question. It, again, they're complementary techniques because with the SEC, you can actually get the fraction of native protein that's turning into aggregate. And a lot of times you can actually see the distribution of aggregates, aggregates, diverse technologies and so on. So that's very valuable. We can't do that directly. We're getting, you know, this correct kinetic parameter, the aggregation rate, which tells us the stability, you know, whether it's from stirring or uh, temperature or changing excipient or other solution conditions. Uh, so it complements the SEC. And then we also saw that, um, you know, the cases where you can see aggregation by SMSLS that you cannot see by SEC. So our recommendation is use both. <laughs> Okay. I think Alex said early on, you know, there's no silver or golden bullet in this space. You have to use a bunch of interwoven techniques. Yeah. So uh, uh, one of the very fundamental questions which has just come is, you know, if one has to really, uh, you know, identify the novelty of this particular technique, um, in, a, in a single word, what would you say that what is actually possible uh, in biopharmaceutical product, which is otherwise not possible, by the techniques which are right now placed in the industry? That's a great question. So first of all is the measuring of kinetics. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all is absolute measurements of molecular weight and virial coefficients. And then the fact that, I mean, essentially it's like uh, 
an absolute scattering instrument, but the 16 under one roof, each completely independent of the other. Um, and so you can run many different things at the same time. You can have something you know, go off in, in 30 seconds and some other one in the cell is gonna go on for three weeks and you can just take out the one in 10 seconds, replace it with another, hit go. And so you can run all these different time scales. So there's a number of uh, unique aspects, but basically it's that, it's 16 absolute light scattering units under one roof. Okay. So uh, I think uh, uh, we have multiple questions which has been received, which are either discussed by the panelist or, or by the speaker themselves. Uh, so with the time constant, I, I will allow now uh, to session to be end. Before I conclude this session, I wish to thank Alex and Wayne Reed for giving a very, very uh, thoughtful presentations. I think uh, most of us who are listener to this uh, will definitely look into this particular technology, whether you know we can utilize for the fundamental uh, evaluation of ours. Uh, we will also look forward when it becomes uh, more compliance and more validation data is coming. Uh, so it can be a viable tool when specifically when, when uh, uh, industry, biosimilar industry is uh, looking for such tools. I wish to thank again Bibhu Sharma, uh, who is, uh, you know, who is the connecting point to us and who has helped us to arrange this particular seminar. Um, I also thank all my four panelists, uh, Dr. Venkar, Dr. Navratan Bajpayee, Dr. Satyam and Samir uh, for giving their valuable time uh, to, to create a, a, you know, quite a thoughtful uh, discussion. Um, I also thank all the audience uh, and uh, Ashwini who is uh, managing this particular program. Uh, so thank you everyone. The, uh, the link is available on YouTube. The entire session is live. Um, on YouTube. So you can go to Biosimilar Workshop uh, uh, on the YouTube. You will find the online link of this particular lecture. You can watch at your own pace. Uh, just to, uh, just to you know, conclude, Biosimilar Workshop is a leading industrial uh, uh, program of, uh, for, for uh, biopharmaceutical industry. What we have started recently is a digital edition where we are arranging uh, multiple educational seminar uh, for uh, the knowledge enhancement of academia as well as industry. So please stay tuned. Uh, we have multiple other seminars coming in next six months. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for paying attention to the seminar. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, and don't hesitate to get in touch if you provide yeah. any more information or help. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.